As a doctor in Victoria, I'm obviously concerned about the increasing threat of coronavirus. I am appalled by the behaviour of several of the most outspoken Victorian opposition MPs who are continually undermining the government's COVID advice and safety messages. This has led to complacency among some Victorians. These politicians often use Twitter to spread their political messages when they should be encouraging people to stay home and get tested if they have symptoms, to wear a mask and socially distance in order to stop the spread of the virus. My question is to Andrew Lamming and the panel. As an elected MP, regardless of your party, shouldn't the needs of your constituents and their safety be the most important priority ahead of this political rhetoric? Thank you. All right, I will put that to our politicians, but let me start uh, with someone on our panel, Vyom Sharma. I know you've been tangling with some politicians <laughs> in your state online in recent weeks. Uh, what's your view? Um, you know, I really think in Victoria we could benefit from a very effective opposition party. We need someone holding the government accountable and there's been so many ways, for, so many opportunities for them to do that, to give some constructive criticism, so some, some, some thorough levels of analysis and yet instead we just see just kind of name-calling, retweeting articles, saying the word unbelievable and, you know, just whining about golf. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, we, we definitely need to hold governments on both levels accountable. Um, and yet, you know, we, we just... We, in fact, we're seeing uh, certain MPs block uh, experts from accessing their Twitter feed are you, because are you they talking know they're about going to pulled out on the facts. Are you talking about yourself and your interactions with Tim Smith? Oh, look, it might be, yeah, sure. But not just me, uh, many other medical professionals have been uh, blocked. And uh, it, it, it's bizarre. Uh, it's not so much that the, it, it's the abuse or anything that's, uh, that's causing Tim Smith to block people. It's experts calling out factual inaccuracies. And uh, that's just not good enough. Is this really what we want to see in Parliament? I, I think people deserve better. We deserve a better opposition. Uh, Abby, does it actually make the treatment of this, the dealing with the crisis harder when you're having politicians engaging in this sort of stuff? And it must be said at, an, at a national level at least, you're seeing a bit of it on, on both sides. It's interesting. It's exactly the same as the politicising about mask wearing. It is a global pandemic. It is a healthcare emergency. We are not here to talk about the politics of the mask versus, you know, the anti-maskers. We are here to take care of sick people. We're in a crisis. So I think we need to stop politicising this entire process. We are all trying to do the best we can, but ultimately it is a healthcare crisis. That is the prime problem with the pandemic. Uh, Andrew Lamming, I mean, I... do, do you wish some of your colleagues would, uh, would lay off the, the keyboard and the, the smartphone a little bit and, and just refrain from, from some of this rancour on social media? Well, I'm a big fan of democracy, vigorous democracy, but it's got to be fact against fact. Um, I'm a big fan of Tim Smith and his work. I don't follow his Twitter account, but let me say I've That's also agonised over the degree to which um, you should give support to our C CMOs and CHOs. At the moment, it's unconditional support from me, but where you see a departure from health recommendations when politicians apply them, then of course an opposition needs to stand up. So my answer to you would be, if it's based on the science, let's support the CHO. But if the CHO gives advice, it's not released by the Premier of the state, and then you're doing something non-scientific in your recommendations, of course the opposition, of course the citizenry, have to stand up against non-scientific recommendations from a government. So, so what do you make I, of your, your <laughs> federal colleague, Craig Kelly? He's, he's posted 19 times on his Facebook mm. page since August 1 about uh, hydroxychloroquine. He's suggested that Dan Andrews could face jail for banning hydroxychloroquine. As a medical professional, what do you make of your colleague uh, talking about this stuff in this way? I can cherry-pick uh, politicians that say all sorts of stuff. If you don't like what they say, unfriend them and don't follow them. He's not in the Cabinet. I mean, my message was, you know, how many children do you want attending school uh, in the, uh, the March-April crisis? And if we agree that it's uh, the children of essential workers and vulnerable families, well, that is nearly half of your population. If you've only got 10% of children at school because you've got an education department uh, dissuading children from turning up, then someone's got to stand up for those children. I chose to do that. It put me almost at odds with the Chief Health Officer, but she wasn't allowed to release her advice she'd given to the Premier. So there's very good reason for an opposition or for any MP or any citizen to stand up against any government if they feel the science 
is being ignored. Lucy Morgan, I can see you very <laughs> eager to get in here. <laughs> Oh, look, I was eager um, a, a minute or two ago to just make the point that um, it was a great source of pride for Australians in the early part of, of this pandemic that um, we had had such a national, united, um, um, non-partisan approach to, to dealing with the pandemic. And, you know, the, the Q&A was full of united voices supporting each other. And I think it's, it's one of the sad things about this second phase of this, of this pandemic, that we are starting to bicker about mm. tweets between us and we've become partisan. I think that's very sad. The other thing, I, I wanted to take it back to some clinical stuff, if I could, just very briefly. Two clinical um, points that came out of something Andrew mentioned earlier. Uh, one is the issue of um, Australians who have chronic health conditions versus the risk that um, our elderly Australians living in um, aged care facilities. I think these are very different groups and I wanted to just make the point that mm -hmm. people with chronic health conditions have actually fared remarkably well in Australia in this pandemic because those who are living at home because they've been able to stay in their home, they've been able to isolate, and there have been support networks that have been able to keep them away from the virus. And we know that they have actually not caught COVID-19 at the same rate that other people have, ca have caught it because they've been home and they've stayed at home and they've followed, followed the recommendations and they've stayed well. The reason that our aged care, that our, you know, our family members in aged care have caught this virus and died so frequently is because that is their home and they are not isolated, they're, they're in an aged care facility. So Andrew, with respect, it's a totally different ball game to be talking about COVID-19 in aged care facilities. The second thing is, a, is, is something slightly less acute and that is the fact that um, we're not talking about two weeks off work for a healthcare worker who catches COVID-19. Where two weeks is the time for quarantine while you're, while you're exposed or waiting for testing. If you're a healthcare worker who catches COVID-19, you are going to be off work for a very long time. If you have a, a significant infection that requires hospitalisation, you are likely to be in hospital for quite a long time. But then when you're out of mm. hospital, it takes weeks and weeks to recover. And we don't really know mm. what the long-term consequences or the long-term tempo of catching this infection is. Mm. So if you're a nurse or a, um, um, a nurse's aide, if you're any sort of clinician, any healthcare worker who catches a COVID infection, you are off the work out of the workplace and off the front line for a very, very long time. It, it, if you've been in intensive care, it is weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks before you even yeah. feel well enough. And one of the things that I'm seeing in patients who've caught COVID and have recovered um, is that there is a very prolonged post-viral syndrome that has a, a variety of um, clinical mm. features but is characterised almost universally by prolonged fatigue, prolonged depression and anxiety, mm. um, joint pains, headaches, all sorts of things that don't relate to catching a pneumonia. But these are so significant that returning to the workplace is almost impossible. So this is a workforce that's being decimated by um, by the infection and will not be back on the front line quickly. And I think we need to remember that as well. Jed Carney, I know very early on in this, uh, you lost your father-in-law to COVID-19. Do you think we sort of owe it as a community that, to those that, that have been lost through this to actually step up and do a bit better as this sort of second wave, if we're calling it that, uh, pushes through the population? Absolutely, Hamish, we do. And I think one of the dangers uh, in this time is that the statistics become just statistics. Uh, uh, you're right, my beloved father-in-law died very early on uh, of COVID. He was doing all the right things. Uh, he had stayed at home. He'd only gone out to the shops a couple of times and he contracted it and tragically passed away. And it was one of the most traumatic experiences, I think, of our family's life having to go through that. So behind every number, there is a grieving family, um, a loved one who will be sorely missed, and we can't forget that. And I think that this last spike in Victoria, when we heard the numbers go up, everybody took a deep breath in and everybody was shocked by that. And I really hope that those two things combined, that, you know, everybody 
needs to do their absolute best because I do know, I, I feel very much for everybody who's been affected by it and as the numbers grow, sadly, more and more of us will be.